It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton back with you live on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to the show. We're broadcasting live today, once again, from Modex, uh, the largest supply chain trade show in the Western Hemisphere, being held right here in Supply Chain City, Atlanta, GA. On this episode, we're speaking with a supply chain technology leader who's helping businesses, and he and his firm, make better decisions rapidly while mitigating risk and navigating through the ever-evolving global business environment so stay tuned as we look to increase your supply chain iq quick programming note like all of our series here at supply chain now you can find our podcast wherever you get your podcast from so find us and subscribe so you don't miss a thing thank you clay uh so let's welcome in my fearless esteemed co-host here on today's show greg white serial supply chain tech entrepreneur supply chain adjutant trusted advisor and atlanta city champion tennis champion how you doing? I said champion twice. Uh, yeah, that's good. I'm doing great. <laughs> team championship, I want to be clear on that. It was a team championship. Always is. Well, I'm just, a team just effort. as I shared with you 13 episodes ago, I'm disappointed we have not seen that golden plate yet yep, hung up I need on to bring the it. studio. I need to bring it. I'll bring it. Maybe I'll bring it tomorrow and we can set it okay. here for some of the some of the shows. <laughs> Well, as much as I want to dive into Greg White's tennis history, we do have... I know a- David does. He doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> we have an outstanding guest here today, a timely guest, uh, David Schillingford, Chairman, Resilience 360. David, how you doing? Very good. Good to be here, Scott. Thank you. Great to have you. Yeah. Um, you Very know, timely to have you here. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Happy to be here. Uh, and w- and we'll, we'll touch on more about why David's here, um, here at Modex, uh, you know, they brought him in. There's so much demand and interest in, of course, coronavirus, but all the associated risk that's related to that. You know, it doesn't start and stop with that. A lot of spillover effect. And, you know, on the short list of folks, short subject matter experts, David's name was near the top, flew him in. And I hear you had a very interactive session here at Modex this morning. Uh, we did. Yep. Great attendance. A lot of good questions. Uh, good information sharing on the topic. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to have the chance, our, our, our viewers, to hear more from David and his expertise here momentarily. But before we get there, uh, David, let's, let's give our, our listeners a chance to get, get to know you just a little bit better. So where are you from? And you know, give us a story or two about your upbringing. Uh, so uh, short version. Yes. Reader's <laughs> Digest <Yeah>. version. <laughs> right. Uh, well, my father was in the British Navy. Uh, so I was born in Malta, little island in the Mediterranean. Yeah, of course. Yep. Should any listeners not know, um, traveled the world with my family as I grew up, uh, studied chemistry at university that was paid at least in part by the British Army, uh, where I landed for eight years, jumping out of perfectly serviceable airplanes. Uh, <laughs> and so, so you established and, yourself as a madman at an early age. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I got paid for it. Does, yeah. that, does that help? No, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Uh, actually that makes it perfectly sane. Yeah, yeah, so uh, left, uh, left that, uh, as I say, after eight years, ended up uh, by chance in New York City helping to recover stolen art. Mm-hmm. Um, and that parlayed into a series of startup ventures around data and analytics and, and risk, uh, ultimately landing in the supply chain space. Wow. So, so from entrapment to, <laughs> <laughs> to supply, yeah. supply chain yeah, science, It wasn't right? much like that. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Probably everyone. not that glamorous, <laughs> was it? Well, Greg, you can't just do that with some of our our, our younger listeners that yeah. may not know yeah, what entrapment point. is. So yeah. That was a movie, back movie in, about art theft. Yeah, yeah, back in the 90s with Catherine Zeta-Jones yep. and Sean Connery, yep. right? Yeah, one yeah. only. No yeah. bad, no bad film with Sean Connery in it. Yeah, oh, and, right. and Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Not in that order. That's right. Well, so let's. As much as I'd love to, uh, you know, David, uh, you've got so many stories that I'm sure we could we could probably have a three hour episode <laughs> and talk more about where you're from and your upbringing. But let's switch gears and, and let's talk shop a bit. So tell us about what Resilience 360 does. Sure. So Resilience 360 is is helping companies around the world make risk a competitive advantage. Uh, It is uh, a critical component of supply chain visibility to be able to know not just where your assets are, but also what risks they might face 
and what is happening right now. Mm. So to have visibility around the assets and to have visibility around the risk and, and the context, uh, we bring all of that together to help companies understand mm. what's happening in their supply chain. So you're, you're analyzing not, not just risk where the assets are, but the butterfly effect too. I mean, what could be happening elsewhere that could be impacting mm. goods or, or other assets elsewhere? I, I, exactly. Yeah. It, it, we have to look at the entire network yeah. to understand the risk that a company is exposed to both predictively and, and in real time. Mm. So, David, I had a chance to, uh, we conducted a webinar in conjunction with Rosia 360 not too long ago. And the, the sheer amount of data points that go into how you convey this, this very actual, usable, uh, very pertinent information is overwhelming. Uh, you know, speak to that a little bit. Sure. Well, we're, we're, we're at an interesting time in, in supply chain management with uh, the genesis of artificial intelligence. And, and what we do and how we do it will always be a human endeavor. But what we're doing right now would not be possible without the types of machine learning that we're employing to pull mm. all of those data points together to create sense of supply chain networks and everything that is happening in the world. But there's always that human layer on top of it mm. to make sure that we're getting the right business context out of that data. All right. So we, we are, as we mentioned on the front end, we're going to get kind of an executive overview of a lot of what you shared here at Modex. So I'm looking forward to that. But before, before we do that, one of the questions we always like to ask senior executives. Is it that time? It's that it's time. That time. <laughs> All right. I, I, th I think I have a, a good idea of, of the answer to this. But um, I, I think what, ha what helps our listeners often to understand um, in a very precise and concise nature what you do is to think about them walking down the hall in their business with the pain that's in their head or their heart or the keywords going through their head, right? What are those things? That, that would indicate to me as a business owner that I, I need what you do at Resilience 360. Sure. So what, it, what is going through the business person's head is, is my supply chain optimized? Mm. Do I have the right balance between the various different components that I have to offset, offset against each other? And am I taking too much risk or not enough risk? Mm. Do I have too much inventory, not enough inventory? So what we're doing is helping companies achieve the right balance and visibility and synchronization end-to-end -end by showing them what, what their risk is and how that's connected back to their, to their core business. I, I hadn't even thought, I'm sorry, I hadn't even thought about the possibility mm. that they aren't taking enough risk. That's a really interesting concept. I mean, I, I think you balance that in your business, but I hadn't really thought about that as a, as a concern, and I can see where there's opportunity there, right? R right. Risk management isn't about Eliminating Take, all risk, uh, right? Uh, correct. It's about yeah. it's about achieving the right balance in yeah. different mm -hmm. companies, in different industries, with different cultures, different supply bases, different demand signals. Every company is going to be different, and they're going to have to make their own decision as to where they want to take the risk, where they don't, and, and, and how they change that on a mm. yearly, monthly, daily basis. Yep. Yeah, you want to take you want to take probably the greatest risk where the risk is the least impact in your business, right? So mm. if you're going to take a risk, take it on your least valuable or least impactful assets. Hmm. Well, take I mean, there are you lots, I mean, sure, there's lots of other ways to do it, but in the simplest case, that's Yeah, right. there's a lot of different levers that, that people can build, and we talk a, lot, talk a lot about agility in supply chain. That's becoming more possible with automation, with yep. visibility, and agility is a critical component of resiliency mm. that allows companies to take more risk but be able to quickly move from plan Respond A to plan rapidly. B. Yeah. yeah. When I think of uh, the current and the modern global supply chain, there are no shortage of factors that um, are front and center for some supply chain leaders, but we all have blind spots. And so using uh, what Resilience 360 does, whether it's growing the business, whether it's managing the business, whether it's avoiding pitfalls, there's so many um, – you, know, you can't know everything. Right. So I really see that this is as, as really helpful. Uh, um, and almost you almost have to have something like this to navigate through the global supply chain industry. So I want to switch gears because uh, I want to really dive into um, what you shared here at Modex today, specifically re related to some of the you know, global threats, including a coronavirus that uh, you weighed in on a uh, bunch of supply chain leaders that are here, manufacturing leaders, you name it. Yeah. So can you give a kind of a executive overview you know 
two or three things that are most important from what you shared here today that you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think, the, I mean, the questions that really sum up the way people are thinking about the coronavirus is, where are we now? What, what, is, what has happened, not just in China, but in, in other countries where the, the virus has, has spread to? What's going to happen next? And, and, and how is that going to impact my business? Therefore, what should, what should I be doing now? Don't right. tell me what I should have done a year ago. Yeah. Tell me what I should be doing today. Mm. That, that was the, the bulk of the conversation. Yep. Interesting, because what happened a year ago can't tell you anything about what you ought to be doing now. We didn't have these conditions then. Right. right. And it, it, it's, it, it's interesting that there are, there are companies, it, it, and it's not quite binary, but, you know, the famous phrase, I mean, Warren Buffett, who said, you only know who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. <laughs> and, and we see that, well, our version of that is playing out now, where yeah. there are, very generally speaking, two types of companies. Those who spent time understanding and mapping out their extended networks yeah. so that they had decent visibility to what's where, and those that didn't, mm-hmm. and those that, that have. I mean, we, we have a, a, a Tier 1 automotive supplier okay. who they actually, after the events in Japan in 2011 with the tsunami, right. they back then started modeling out their supply chain mm-hmm. and looking to get extended network visibility. We were talking to them about this late December, and they were already starting their contingency planning then. Mm. They're in good shape as, as, wow. as much as they possibly can be. We're talking, you know, last week we got a call from a a similar company that hadn't done that. It's a very different discussion. So, Mm. sure, I don't think anyone really saw this coming. But there are companies that were prepared for it because they were prepared for this or something like it. Yeah. Contingency and scenario planning. Well, and if you do that, what this is doesn't really matter. It's your foresight towards it and the impact that you expect from it. And then is that sort of what your tool set, does that help companies plan but also respond? That's right, yeah. It, it's used during planning a- and execution. You've got to be able to put the right plan in place but understand that the you plan's always going to change. Yeah. And it, could, it might not be as severe as something we're experiencing now like coronavirus. Mm-hmm. It could be something that's actually a daily event like weather that, that just creates an, an hour's delay. If that happens a million times... That's a huge economic impact. Mm, yeah. So we, we think about the extended network, not just in terms of disruption, but also delay yep. and, and everything in between. So every, every risk is a little bit different. Mm. Outstanding. Yeah. So uh, what else from your, from your discussion this morning, uh, what, else, what else needs to be heard with the, about the business community? So I th- one, of the, one of the discussions that took up quite a bit of time on the panel was trying to understand from what has happened in China in terms of the government's reaction initially not reacting and then a very strong reaction mm-hmm. what can we what can we in other countries learn from that in terms of what, what is an appropriate response for a government to make we see Italy is now responding more forcefully to what, what is happening there see it's other European countries looking very closely at, at Italy more border control mm starting to see things happening in, in, in the U.S. And a lot of the questions were, well, what, what, what is the right response? Because it's not the virus that is causing economic pain. It's right. the reaction to the virus. Yep. And it's a, it's a tough balance because you have to react. But if you overreact, you create more pain than might be necessary. Mm. Yeah. All right. So if I can ask you, um, you know, we, if we hear anything through the conversations here, through the conversations we, ha- we heard, had earlier at the Atlanta Supply Chain Awards, through the conversations we're having with business leaders, wherever they are, there's this constant debate, discussion around, okay, are we, are we acting appropriately or is there a great deal of overreaction in the marketplace? And, and frankly, like we've, we've talked to a 1,000 people, we hope Literally. 10 years from now, yeah, that's mm-hmm. right, yeah. we hope 10 years from now that the story will be, that this is a huge supply chain story versus human health story. Yeah, I'm not sure. What's your What's your take as you as you try to read the tea leaves and predict where we go from here? Do you see more appropriate action being taken, or do you see a few elements of of overreaction? What's your take? Well, so I think it it depends 
what we're talking about in terms of whether the reaction has been appropriate or an overreaction, whether we're talking about the government, whether mm, we're talking about gotcha. private businesses, or whether we're talking about consumers in general, markets in general, de- demand risk, or you know how the stock market is, is behaving. And where an overreaction is, is, is possible, like markets and consumer behavior, we, we generally we're seeing an overreaction. Mm. From a government standpoint, we do see overreaction and generally political the political incentives are more short term than they are long term mm, yeah. and the political risk of underreacting to something like this is 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 pretty significant mm. so it is it is likely whether it is to do with inside a country or or the borders of a country uh, we expect the responses to be pretty severe mm. and then in the middle is, is is the business world where people are being far more pragmatic about it but assume as as as, as, sure, as soon as the safety of a workforce is at peril, then factories get closed down sure. pretty quickly. That's right. And ships back up in ports. And uh, you have, uh, I think a lot of folks, especially that are outside of supply chain, don't, don't know it, um, just how bad global supply chains have been impacted. And unfortunately, by, yep. both, by, by most accounts, most predictions, that the worst is still yet to come in terms of the impact on operations, which – you know, it takes us back to what Resilience 360 does and the insights there and how you mentioned some companies are much more prepared than others because they plan for this and they've got the right data, or at least a lot more of the right data, at their fingertips. Speak to that a little bit more, how important that is, especially in 2020 in the era we live in. Well, there's a, whether a company is overreacting or underreacting, is a, a lot of it is, is is emotional, it's visceral, it's 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 driven by fear and anxiety and what shareholders think. Yeah. And the, the only way to deal with that is is with data, and it, it's a, a classic example of where we are right now, where people are getting data out of China, they don't know how to read it, and without ground truth data Mm. either sensor-based data where we see assets where they are how they're acting or where we have like our partners in the dhl network who actually have boots on the ground who are able to say it's open it's closed it's opening it's closing and to be able to report that back through the network is is really the only way to deal with this and to be making the right business decisions with with the right degree of confidence yeah is there any data that's telling us anything right now about China. I mean, we're hearing reports periodically um, that factories are restarting, that shipments are starting to move. Do we know anything about any of that? We, we do, absolutely. And you have to sort of take it from the top down because what, what, the, what the government, what the federal government in, in China is, is, is doing and saying is, is an important part of this. But then how are the local governments responding in terms of allowing trucks to move, allowing workers back to factories, and then you have the individual company level where even if a factory is open, it is, is the workforce back? And right. what we're looking at is how those factories are opening and closing, what percentage production they are at, and whether or not the goods that need to come into the back of the factory or out of the end of the factory are actually able to move. Because a lot of the disruption has been around transportation. Right. You have a truck but no driver, nothing moves. <laughs> Good point. Mm-hmm. All right, so... Um, I don't want to leave this this component as we move into a little bit more of a broader conversation uh, with David. Um, anything else before we move broader, kind of hearing some of the other things you're tracking right now? Any, do you th- Anything else that needs to be said based on the coronavirus discussion this morning? So I think that the, the one thing I would want to leave the listeners with is, is th- there's a risk that people are being told, ah, you should have done this a month ago or a year ago. Well, A, that's unhelpful, but B, it's the wrong advice because the things that people should be doing tactically to work out what is their next step, what is their plan, is really the first step in a month, year, five-year-long journey towards improving network visibility. Mm. It, it's not a binary thing. It's a, yeah. it, it's a journey, and people should start that journey today, yeah. make their tactical planning part of their longer-term strategic planning. Do you see that happening? I mean, do you see companies that are responding pretty rapidly to provision for that kind of? We, we do. We do. We, I mean, we, we see uh, across the board those who are really well prepared and responding in a, and executing in a, uh, the best way possible. We see those that are at the opposite end of the spectrum and then, and, and then people in the middle who 
supply chain managers are extremely good at responding to this this type of thing, and mm-hmm. a lot of companies are are really pulling out all of the stops. Mm-hmm. They just need to make that part of their culture going forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's uh, shift gears. Let's, let's go broad as, as we start to kind of wind and in, in, interview down. So when you look out beyond the coronavirus and you go broader, you know, the, the modern day global end to end supply chain, there's no shortage of, of topics, issues, innovations, you name it. What's one or two that is getting your attention more than others right now? Sure. So I'll, gi- I'll give you three and I'll tie all three back to coronavirus. Hey, I love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. If I can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so, uh, I think two of them, p- people spend a, a, a ton of time talking about. One is uh, omni-channel e-commerce. The second is automation. And then the third is, we'll call it analytics. Okay. So what we are seeing with coronavirus is a, a change in terms of demand signals and, mm-hmm. and pull signals. And there are more goods. That, that, that There's more online demand. So it, it's a macro trend. The question there is, will this accelerate some of the move online? We think it will, at least for certain, certain types of products. Yep. Second, automation. Uh, there's, you can sum the coronavirus issues up largely by saying it's a workforce issue. It is, it is manifesting itself in the workforce. And automation... Is, it, it's here to stay. It, it, it's coming. It, it's driving so many of the things, particularly you look around the exhibit hall here. Yeah. So it, it is likely that this will further accelerate that trend. And then the third is around predictive analytics. And there's a lot of talk about predictive analytics. We're not seeing a ton of it actually in action, being used day to day to drive predictive or prescriptive decision making. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that that we see is that more and more risk is being made part of that tool set. You cannot have predictive analytics without taking risk into account. Mm. And more and more we're seeing risk becoming intertwined in planning and execution decision making. It's making that decision making more predictive, more prescriptive. And again, the coronavirus will accelerate that trend. Yeah. We have uh, almost inarguably, we have uh, risk. It's kind of like supply chain. You know, look at the last eight, ten years, whatever the right time frame is. Supply chain has a seat at the table, and supply chain leadership has a seat at the table unlike ever before. And in a similar fashion, I think risk, especially in the last two or three years, maybe three or four years, I'll defer to the experts, seems to be much more important, much more relevant. Uh, Leadership wants to know where that uh, factors into the big and small decisions that are be made mm-hmm. that are being made is that kind of what you're sensing as well yeah that that we, we've been seeing that but the sea change happens when the importance is transferred from something that is important but separate to something that is part of supply chain decision making so that planning systems execution systems take risk into account in every decision all yep. of the time we may if if we're right about this, we might even stop calling it supply chain risk. It'll right. just be su- predictive analytics. Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, we call it <laughs> we call it the risk-adjusted supply chain, but that's right. a bit of a mouthful. Right. Uh, I think really what we're talking about is is predictive and prescriptive analytics. I think we're I think we think of risk, and and a couple of other terms that you use in supply chain, service level or customer experience. I think we think of those in different buckets, but in truth, they are all elements of risk. One or, or the two the customer experience and service level are really rolling the dice with your inventory trying to optimize your inventory to say i'm willing to take some outs some stock outs in a in a usual circumstance um, so that i don't hold so much inventory that i break the bank and then risk being generally and probably until today at least for me aligned with those disruptions in the supply chain that you're trying to minimize the impact uh, of in 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 uh, addition to the other risk that you right. intentionally taking. Mm. Well, I think right? the, the the definition of risk should be the difference between what I expected to happen and the and what's happening. Yep, yep. And and that's it's not just disruption. It's yeah. delay. Yes. Yeah. It's it's any any type of variance. Yeah, that's yep. exactly that, right. And and that's supply chain management. And you're right. It, it if people use that paradigm to look at it, it will 
take on a new a new name because it will be standard risk and disruptive risk right. taking somehow uh, compiled exactly. together. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So as much as I'd love to pick your brain a lot more, and, and this, this conversation is really um, – there is a uh, big picture strategic element uh, based on kind of what, what you're seeing, where businesses are going today. And then there's just a grassroots, hey, are, are the folks on the front tip of the spear, the folks, you know, in the chairs, planning, uh, managing warehouse, it, it, it's such an interesting kind of a, a two-pronged conversation. But we'll have to have you back. Um, so, but before we uh, wrap up this episode, we want to make sure where can folks learn more about Resilience 360. Uh, very simple. Go to the website, resilience360.com. And there's a great annual report that I think the uh, latest edition just came out. Uh, in fact, part of the webinar was uh, getting your members of your team to weigh in on the top 10 supply chain risks for 2020. Fascinating stuff there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the replay is available for folks that go back to and, and, and register with uh, uh, the Resilience 360 team. Um, and you well, you may have a little bit of a shortage of, of keynotes coming up because there's been so many cancellations. But anything, what's next beyond Modex? I mean, clearly, the Modex team loved having you, you know, flying here and, and, and participating in today's conversation. What's next? Uh, well, it, it, it's a good question. That we are getting a lot of invitations to to talk about coronavirus and its impact on supply chain. A lot of different conferences will be speaking at the. Uh, Association of Supply Chain Managers later in the year. We've got uh, a number number coming up in, in the short term, so we're, we're keeping pretty busy. In demand, in demand. Well, <laughs> I, I, also, I like how you put it. <clears throat> Have you been on CNBC yet? Because I see that in it's your coming. future. I do. It's I coming. see that, that in your future. That's a huge question. right? Okay. Everybody's talking Not, supply chain. Not yet. Yeah. And yeah. soon supply chain risk or, as David put it, predictive analytics yeah. is where, what it's going to be called. Uh, really enjoyed it. David Schillingford, Chairman of Resilience 360. We'll have to have you back on. Uh, there's so much more that we could dive in and, and pose to you, but really appreciate your time and safe travels from here. I think right. you're departing the area today, right? Yep. Very All good. Right. Thank you very much, Scott. Pleasure. Thank you, David. All right, so as we wrap up here, we continue our coverage of Modex 2020. Great conversation. Yeah. Uh, great day, to a uh, great interview to wrap up here day two, huh? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is, this has been the topic of the conference since before the conference started. So, mm. you know, there was a, it, it was a question being asked as to whether this conference would start. So this is an eminently relevant topic. Its, it's impact is going to be long-term, and I think it's great, by the way, for us to be able to access your knowledge, David, because you have, uh, you know, a really boots-on-the-ground kind of viewpoint. Mm. Uh, as well as a strategic viewpoint of what's going on out there. And Thank millions you. of data points uh, mm. helping folks get better and better making decisions. And millions. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so big thanks to, of course, our guest, David Shedlingford, Chairman yep. of Resilience 360. Big thanks to our audience for tuning in. Be sure to check out other upcoming events, replays of our interviews, other resources at supplychainnowradio.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. On behalf of Greg White and the entire team here, Vicki and Amanda and Clay and Michelle, everybody's here today. Scott Luton wishing you a wonderful week ahead, and we will see you next time on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.